has raised global concerns about the safety of nuclear energy. To talk about that, we're joined by Joshua Pierce, a professor of mechanical engineering at Queen's University. He was part of a study that looked into the pros and cons of nuclear energy. Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon. Well, certainly the situation in Japan has put nuclear safety front and center, and what we're being told here at home is that Canada's fleet of nuclear reactors have sufficient safety measures in place. The situation in Japan simply could never happen here. But didn't the Japanese nuclear industry say the same thing? Uh, absolutely. And the, really the proof in the pudding is if the Canadian nuclear industry can afford insurance to cover the liability for an accident occurring here in Canada. What does that mean? The problem is not a single nuclear power plant can be built anywhere on this earth unless the government puts a, an artificial cap on the amount of liability the company that would, would have to cover in the event of an, an accident or a potential serious disaster like the one we're seeing unfold in Japan. So wait a minute, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Without insurance, the industry can't ensure that there are safety measures in place? Without an artificial cap on how high the liability could go, right. the, insure, the, the industry can't exist at all. And so every country that has nuclear power has put an artificial cap on that, the amount of liability that the industry would have to suffer in the event of uh, an extremely unlikely, but as we're seeing now, certainly possible okay. accident. But let's, but let's talk about the possibility of something happening. We don't want to scare our audience unnecessarily, but we are looking at events sometimes beyond our control. You know, in Japan, it was the earthquake and the tsunami that followed. But what about human error? You know, take Chernobyl, for example. Right. There are, there are dozens of ways that, that some, once something like this could happen, and all we can do is reduce the probability of it happening. The only way to quantify whether or not it will, will truly happen is to figure out what the insurance premium would have to be in order to cover the likelihood of it occurring. And what's a little bit, what is truly scary, scary is that not a single nuclear reactor anywhere in the world has been able to go on the free market and be able to afford insurance to cover the risk. And so what, what we've done, what, what our study looked at, was what is the, the indirect subsidy that the government is providing to the nuclear power industry in order to be able to, ins to insure them. Uh, in the U.S., which is the case that we looked at, it, the U.S. government has put a $10 billion cap on liability, which means that if there were an accident in, let's say, cost $20 billion worth of damage, the, the taxpayers would be footing half of the bill. The huge anti-nuclear lobby is saying, you know, when is the world going to wake up and realize that nuclear energy, as far as they're concerned, is risky? Time to start looking at alternative forms of energy, so why aren't we doing that if the scenario you're painting is the one we're living with on a day-to-day -day basis? I, I think we are doing that, and that's something that the, the study would look at specifically. We took that insurance liability the indirect subsidy from the nuclear industry and looked at what would happen if the same indirect subsidy, same amount of money, were transferred to a renewable energy source like a photovoltaic industry. And so in the photovoltaic industry, they don't really have to worry about insurance because you know it doesn't matter whether an earthquake or tsunami, that's not going to cause some sort of catastrophic event because of solar. But what the solar industry could use in terms of indirect subsidy would be a loan guarantee for manufacturing. And so what we found, if you take the indirect subsidy from nuclear and transfer it to solar, you end up with more power and more electricity from solar by mid-century and trillions of dollars of additional electricity on the end of the line top of the nuclear fleet in the U.S. So already, just looking at this one single, relatively small, indirect subsidy that's transferred to another part of the energy sector, we get more electricity out. Okay. Professor Joshua Pierce, appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.